Nice jacket, by the way. I think everyone should wear jackets on stage. I think it should become the new rule, don't you reckon? I reckon. I only wear mine because it means you can't see how good my wife's cooking is. <laughs> Thanks. It's going to take me a bit to set up because I use a, an old-fashioned computer instead of one of these modern iPad things. And Microsoft takes time to start up sometimes. There we go. So it's a privilege to be able to come and talk again today. I really enjoy being able to preach. For me, preaching is the last part of what has been a really interesting journey. Preparing to preach is what you know I love because I spend so much time thinking about all this stuff and praying over it and reading that I normally don't find the time to do. And so this is my privilege, and I really am grateful to Andrew and the team here and for all of you being able to put up with me so that I get the chance to do this. So thank you. I've been thinking over the last few weeks about Easter. I think you know Easter was an important year, important part of the year for, for the church, always has been. Um, and in my tradition as a Baptist growing up, Easter was a time to go on holiday. And we kind of went to Easter Sunday, but we never bothered with the rest of the meetings. So when this year Andrew organised a Maundy Thursday um, reflection and then a Good Friday morning, and I happened to be hosting on Good Friday, I thought, blow, I have to go to church over Easter. Never done that before. <laughs> and it was great. I really enjoyed it. It really uh, helped to ha- help me in the reflection of what Easter was all about. And I've been reading a couple of books and listening to you know, the sermons we've had here and a few other things. And, and there's been one story about the whole of that Easter week that really stood out in my mind. And so when it came to being preparing to speak, that was the kind of the foremost story for me. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, the title of today is From Revolution to Revival. I didn't intend that to be what I was going to talk about, by the way, but what I started off looking at is the chapter John, uh, chapter 13 of John, which is the story of when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I tend to read it in several ways. First of all, I like to know the history and what's going on, and I read it with my mind. And then after a while, I start looking out for those things that sort of stand out to you. And there are two verses in this that I just did not understand why John put them in there. You know, what was the point of those two verses? Do you ever get that feeling? You're reading the Bible and it's all going well and you think, why did he say that? And it's kind of, it just causes you to stop and think. And it's a a kind of a moment to sit and reflect on it. And for me, the way I deal with that is I start telling the story. I start thinking about, well, okay, so what was Jesus thinking about at this moment in time? What were the disciples thinking about? What would it have been like to be there? And as you employ your imagination and the Holy Spirit works through that imagination to help you understand it, the verses make sense. So I'm going to read John 13, first 15 verses, if that's okay. Um, And you can follow through on the screen or in your Bibles. And then uh, we'll pray. And then I'll start to hopefully make some new sense out of the story that certainly was revelation for me. So John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you're never going to wash my feet. Typical Peter, eh? And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, no, no, a person who's had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, although not every one of you, because he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. 
When he'd finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. So now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that as we open your word, um, we come before thousands of years of understanding and history, and yet you take that written word and you make it living in us as we listen to you and listen to your Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, I pray that as I speak, as I begin to share what you've shown me in this process, Lord, that you would unpack that for each of us individually. Lord, that each one of us would hear what we need to hear, what we need to take out of this for our own lives. Lord, that you'd speak to us, that you'd take written word and make it revelation. And as you make it revelation, we would act on that word and live it out in our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So my hope is to kind of tell this story a little differently and put it in some context. And in the light of that, we can revisit those those two verses I was talking about. So let's start by thinking about a bit of history. First century Judea. What was it like for Jesus' time? About a hundred and something years ago in in Judea, the Hasmoneans had, had a revolution. They kicked out the Seleucids. I can never pronounce that word properly. Is Stuart here? No, he won't correct me in that case. (laughs) He's very good on his history. (laughs) But uh, so they kicked out and they they managed to create Israel as a nation and they ruled Israel independently for about 70 or 80 years. And when they were governing Israel, they were governing it as priests because the Hasmoneans were actually priests. They weren't part of David's kingly line. They weren't Judeans. And so it was a little bit of an odd stage in the history of Israel. So for 400 years, since Jeremiah's prophecy and, and, the, and the Israelites returning from Babylon, for 400 years, Israel had been a nation without a king of the, of the rule of David. For the last 60 or 70 years, the Romans have been ruling. And Roman rule wasn't a very pleasant rule. The Romans had a very simple process of governing countries. They would put local governments in. They'd allow them a certain amount of freedom as long as they paid their taxes. Everything was okay. So primarily, Roman rule was about extending their influence and taking money. So there was a lot of poverty in the the nation. Israel was primarily agricultural. Uh, People farmed and fished, and that's how they survived, which is pretty much a subsistence income, isn't it? Those of you who farm and fish now know it's pretty much hard work. And now the Romans were taxing that really heavily. And on top of that, you had the temple. The temple took their own taxes. Now, we think 33% is a lot of tax. I would hate it to have lived in those days. That was nothing compared to what these guys had to pay. The temple was still functioning. They still had the Pharisees and the Sadducees operating the temple, so they still had the sacrifices going. But the corruption within the temple was extreme. Too much tax, too many rules, placing constrictions on people's behavior that meant that they got punished when they got it wrong, made it a climate of fear for everybody living there. So you had an environment of oppression, effectively of slavery, and significant poverty. What kept the Jews alive, what kept them together as a nation through this time, was the prophetic words that God had spoken through Isaiah and Jeremiah 400 odd years ago, saying there was going to be a new king. If you look at Jeremiah 33, uh, Jeremiah said, uh, prophesied this, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the throne of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord our righteousness. For this is what the Lord said, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. 
nor will the priests who are Levites ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifice. That prophecy amongst the prophecies which Isaiah had basically gave the Jews hope that no matter how bad it was today, there was hope. God was going to rescue them. He always had in the past. He was going to do it again. And that was what kept them going, their hope in a Messiah. Now, they tried in their own strength to have revol revolts and to, to overthrow the Romans, and it hadn't worked. But there was this sense of expectation across the nation that one day God was going to rescue them. So that's the kind of context of the nation. That's what was going on in the country at the time. But, but what was happening in Jerusalem at that time? If you think about it, just before the Passover that Jesus was celebrating here, he had raised Lazarus from the dead about a week or two earlier. So if you look at uh, John 11, verse 44, it talks about the story about ja Lazarus had been dead for three or four days. And Jesus raised a couple of people from the dead, but they were people who had just died. This was different. He'd been buried. He'd been wrapped up. You know, Martha said to Jesus, you don't want to go in there because he's going to stink. Um, and Jesus raised him from the dead. It was dramatic. It was just outside Jerusalem, and everyone was excited about it. It says in that passage that many people were caused to believe by it. Not long after, Jesus starts going into Jerusalem, and if you remember, he goes and finds the colt of a donkey, and he rides that into Jerusalem, and you have this amazing triumphal entry. And in that triumphal entry, there are palm leaves being put on the ground. There are people declaring and singing, this is, this is the coming king. The king is coming into Israel. And they saw two fulfillments of prophecies. They were singing out Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. And they were recognizing what it says in Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, you have this prophetic expectation of a revolution. You have a person that everyone says, man, this guy can do things. He can raise the dead. He can walk on water. He can feed thousands of people on a loaf of bread. And he's walking into Jerusalem at the most significant time in our calendar. This has got to be the Messiah coming to save us all. The general expectation at that stage would have been of not revival, but revolution. The Pharisees were getting worried that their reputation was going to be harmed, that the, that the Romans were going to get upset by all of this. This new king, what's that going to do for us? And so there was an awful lot of emotion going on at the time. And what does he do when he gets there? He starts overturning the temple, the temple um, sellers. He goes into the temple and upsets the temple operation and starts stirring things up for the Pharisees. The sort of thing that you would expect someone to do who was a civil leader who was going to come in and make lots of change happen. Now, the disciples clearly thought the same. Now, if you, if you look at Luke 9, uh, which is just before this, they were, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there didn't welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Let's make an example of them. You know, these, these what are you going to call them? I can't think of the right word. Um, you know, these, these, this village, they don't believe in you. They don't worship you. We need to set an example of these guys because if we're going to take over... If we're going to kick the Romans out, we need everyone to be on our side. So let's just call down fire, wipe them out, and then everyone will realize that you're serious about this kind of revolution thing. Why else would they have thought about doing that, you know? So suddenly you've got this revolutionary theory. The general expectations was that the Messiah was going to lead a revolution. It would have to be a revolution of force to kick the Romans out. They weren't going to go peacefully. What an expectation. Was that what Jesus was thinking? Probably not. Certainly not, sorry. So the disciples, in the context of this, if you think about there's this man who is coming in to become the new king, what's going to happen when he you know, creates this revolution? Well, we haven't got an army of people. We don't have lots of swords. It's going to have to be the, the armies of heaven, the angels of heaven are going to come in and kick the Romans out. And then we're going to have to govern, aren't we? 
So, so Jesus, um, when we're kind of governing and you've got your court going, can I be Chancellor of the Exchequer, please? Because I really like finance. You know? Or maybe it was, look, we're going to have to create our own army, so I'd quite like to set up the army, if that's okay. You know? so, so you can have um, you know, Peter on your left-hand side doing all the finance stuff, and I'll be on the right-hand side doing all the military stuff, and, and maybe Mary over here can do our social welfare thing. The logical conversation at that stage is, if we're going to set up a new government, is we all get jobs. Yeah? We're all going to be responsible. We're going to be leaders in this new government. We've been the only ones who've been you for the, all the last few years. And you're going to come along and give us an opportunity to start making a change. So then three or four times in the New Testament, the disciples start saying, who's, who's, can I sit on your right-hand side? Or their mum says, you know, can these guys sit next to you, please? Um, or whatever. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven was their question. And it wasn't a silly question. It wasn't just... Um, pride saying well surely I've sacrificed the most it was a real question about when we turn over the government what are we going to do how do we do that because I, I really want to get prepared for this you know this is a big deal every time that came up Jesus turned around and said no no, no you've got it wrong it's not up to you to tell that and and you're not going to walk the same path as me anyway so you know this is not going to happen and not long after that Judas goes off to betray Jesus and I think why would Judas do that the only reason I can think of, and this is my speculation, it's not in the Bible, but the only reason I can think of is that Judas had lost hope. And he saw one of two outcomes here. Either I'm going to betray him to the Jews, the Jews are going to arrest him, and Jesus is just going to have to show his true colors. We're going to push him into this revolution. You know, he's not going to be able to say no. He's going to have to actually stand up and make it happen. So I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kick the bucket. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to push things forward because we know where this has got to go. And, and I need to just give it a shove to make sure things really happen that way. Or he had completely lost hope. And, I, and we don't know which it is. But I think it, you know, it's quite reasonable to assume that Judas thought he was probably doing what he needed to do to make the revolution happen. So this is the context leading up to dinner. We've had a good day. We've been to the temple. We've done lots of preaching. We've seen some healings. We've come back to, to the, the house for dinner, and we're going to sit down for dinner. And Jesus is looking around at his disciples thinking, okay, so I'm hearing the conversations, and I understand what they're thinking. You know, and, and then you come back to these verses in John. You know, John 1. Jesus knew the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. It's one of those verses that I think, why did John put that in there? This is his backdrop to washing the feet. Jesus washed their feet in order to show them the full extent of his love. And the second thing he said in verse 3 is, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power that he had come from God and was returning to God. In other words, if he'd wanted to, revolution was absolutely on the cards, and it would succeed. He had no doubt that if he needed to, he could call down you know, thousands of angels, the Romans would be kicked out, all the slaves would be sent home, and Israel would become his nation again. It was possible. So... John prefaces the, the passage about washing the feet with these two things. First of all, Jesus loved his disciples and wanted to demonstrate it. And secondly, Jesus knew that what the disciples were thinking could actually happen. And somehow he had to derail their thoughts, get them back on the plan, because Jesus' plan had nothing to do with revolution. That's why washing the feet became an important thing to do. You know, that's why Peter objected. Because when Jesus came to wash Peter's feet, Peter looked at it and thought, hang on, if you, my Lord and Master, are washing my feet, taking the role of a servant, taking away that, you know, this is not a king doing this. Kings don't wash people's feet. This, this is not, this, this isn't where we're going, Jesus. If you remember, Peter was the one who, when he declared, yes, we know that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. Peter took him on one and said, no, no, hang on, that's not happening, Jesus. You can't die. You know, we, we're in a revolution here. You've got to lead us. Same thing happening again. You, you can't serve us because if you serve us, if you take that role, there's no way that I can run the country with you. It's not going to happen. The whole thing was impossible in Peter's mind to understand. And I think it helps us to see how different the kingdom of God is. 
If you look at the church today, you know, so much of the church, the big kind of global mega church structures, they look just like the world, don't they? They're the same kind of corporations with the same marketing plans, the same HR plans. They, they just look like big businesses in the business of Jesus. But Jesus was not in the business of revolution. He was not in the business of structures and growth and all of those other wonderful things that the world cares about. He was in the business of servant, servanthood. Jesus made a point of that when he gets to the next verse, verse 13, at the end of it. And he says, you call me teacher and Lord, rightly so. Now that I have washed your feet, you need to do it for the other people. So he's rubbing it in. He's saying to Peter, okay, I've washed your feet and you're right. That's not what a king does. And now you're right too. You need to go and do this as well. This is what you are called to do. This is what we're building. A bunch of foot washing people, a bunch of servants. Servants don't have any control. They don't get to choose what they do or when they do it. They get to do what they're told. That's not a revolution. That's not us coming in on this wave of success to take over. It's quite the opposite. It's us learning to serve other people. And at the end of the same passage, John 13, 34, he adds this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this all men will know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. This is the only command Jesus actually gave us before he died, was that we should love one another. And he says that in the context of the foot washing. He says that in the context of just before the cross and saying, so you're going to serve one another and it's serving out of love that is going to be the distinguishing factor of the Christians in the world. That's how people are going to know you. Yeah, we talked about, we sang um, Jesus on the mountaintop, Jesus in the streets. You know, what does that look like? This is what it looks like. If we want to speak Jesus in our community, if we want to speak Jesus on the mountaintops, we need to be people who love and put our love in action in the way we serve the people around us. Because that's the only message the world will recognize. They don't see our words very much. They see our actions, don't they? So, to me, this, this story is not about, you know, we should all be servant leaders. You could get that out of it. It's not about... Forgiveness, although there is that element of forgiveness, needing to wash your feet is about forgiving yourself daily, you know, finding forgiveness daily. But it is about understanding the radical nature of a kingdom of light versus a kingdom of darkness. It is about realizing that our lives should look completely different from the lives of those who are not in the church. And the significant difference should not be that we go to church on Sunday, it should be that we live lives of love. So I had three thoughts out of this. Number one is that putting God's love in action is our revolutionary task. That is the task that if we do it, will turn the world upside down. I read in the paper this morning on, online um, about uh, the new bus that's coming from Tapawera into Motorwake. I don't know if you saw that uh, in Nelson's stuff. And the same people who organise it, it's a charity that organises it, also organised something called Willing Wheels, which is a bunch of drivers here in Motawaka who will take people to appointments who couldn't get them otherwise. I thought, isn't that cool? There's people there serving their community. But, you know, I've met people who serve in their community, and when you talk to them, they're doing it as a grudge because they think the government should be doing it, and it's just not fair, so I was prepared to do it. But there's no love for the person they're serving. They're doing it to make them feel better, to fill a gap that they think somebody else should do, and there's a bitterness in their heart. Yeah? We could work alongside them, but if we did, we would have to do it out of love for the person we're serving, not out of a desire to satisfy our own needs to be needed. Do you see what I mean? So even if we're not doing, you know, even if we're working in other people's charitable organizations, helping and serving our community, the nature of the way we do it should be different from those people alongside us. Because we're not doing it out of the love of serving, we're doing it out of the love of the person we're serving. So that's my first thought, yeah? It's interesting that Jesus never resisted Rome. In the whole of his sermons, in everything he did, he not once spoke against Rome. He spoke against the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And if you think about it, they were the people who were supposed to be serving him. They were the church leaders of his church. And so when he corrected them, he was correcting the people who should have been part of what he was doing. 
But he never said to the centurion, yeah, you need to deal fairly with people. You know, you, you're a bad soldier. You shouldn't be occupying the land. He never went to Herod and said, you shouldn't be king. This is not your country. Never happened. He didn't once say anything. In fact, the only time he talked about Rome was when they said, should we pay taxes? And he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. You know, I think there's so much desire in our hearts to rise up and do something that we forget that our call is to love, first and foremost. Now, I think protests have a place, you know. If a protest is carried out out of love rather than anger, then it can carry the message of Jesus. Martin Luther King was an example of that. But so often, protests become angry, and they become, um, the kind of the characteristic becomes that of the hatred of the opposing force that they then lose all possibility of representing Jesus. And I think of the people who occupied the White House. You know, there's a whole bunch of prophetic words behind all of that, and there are still a lot of people in America who thought they were doing God's work by taking the White House by force. But I don't see how Jesus would ever have done that. I don't see how you could ever identify that with Jesus. My, my daughter would tell me that um, things like Greenpeace are really valuable, and I'd agree. I don't like Greenpeace very much but I'm really grateful for what they've done in helping us to care for the world better because we wouldn't care for the world as well as we do now if it wasn't for people like that. And there's a whole bunch of other protest organisations out there that probably weren't very Christian that, that used methods that I wouldn't approve of, but, but there is a really important place to raise a voice to speak against injustice. Um, the key thing to me, though, is we have to do it out of a love for the person we're helping. The second thing that struck me was that Jesus always resisted using force as a means to achieve his purposes. I was reading a book called How to Hear God by um, Pete Grieg the other day. And he was talking about how you hear God. And he said one of the things that God normally speaks through is, is a whisper. Remember Elijah on top of the mountain? God came in the earthquake and the fire and the storm. And God wasn't in any of those. He was in the still, quiet voice at the end of it. And then he went through and he picked other examples and said, look, look, look. Where, where did God ever shout to get our attention? I can't think of, I think maybe the guy who, you know, when, when the hand of God wrote on the wall, many, many tekel parsec, if I remember it was, you know, for the Babylonian king. I can't think of any other example where God raises his voice to get our attention. God always whispers. And then you think, well, why is that? One of the reasons God whispers is because he wants us to choose to obey. It's pretty hard not to obey if you have thunder and lightning and a voice out of the cloud that says, go to Nelson. I mean, what are you going to do? Say no? You have to be pretty strong and pretty courageous to ignore it, wouldn't you? You certainly couldn't turn around and say, well, God never, you know, well, maybe you could, but, but, but you know, the, the reason God comes gently to us is because he wants us to choose to partner with him. He wants us to choose to work with him. And so God whispers. And I so often want God to speak loudly. Yeah? Lord, where are we going to live next year? I want you to show me. Give me, give me a vision, a prophetic voice. You know, someone can stand and lay their hands on me and wouldn't that be cool? I'd know what you were talking about then. But, but how often does that happen? Hardly ever. Most of the time, God whispers. And we need to learn to tune into that whisper. But the thing that this story strikes me is if I'm expecting God's whispers to be of the for, in the form of radical overthrowing of whatever, if I'm expecting God to speak powerfully and effectively forcefully, then I'll miss it when he speaks quietly. Because we hear what we expect to hear. You know, I love that phrase in the Simon and Garfunkel song, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. It is so true of me, let alone, you know, I think it's true of the nature of people, isn't it? We, we hear what we're expecting to hear. So if I expect God to speak in a certain way, then it's so easy to miss the whispers. The third thing that struck me is that uh, the world's whole focus is personal gain. It's about selfishness, you know. And a lot of the churches adopted the same things. You know, you read about giving because God will give back to you. So what's the purpose of giving? It's so that God gives back to me. That's not a particularly loving way of living, is it? You know, there's so many messages out there that are really all about, if you do this, you'll benefit. If you pray harder, God will answer your prayers. If you serve more, God will bless you. Well, 
God will bless you if you serve. I'm sure that's true. But if my motivation for serving is to be blessed, then I've got the whole thing wrong. Yeah? It's totally upside down. We're supposed to live here as a servant, looking for our master's gain, looking for God's gain, seeking first the kingdom of God, not seeking first my own kingdom and my own benefit. And that really struck me. You know, so often I'm praying, Lord, Lord, I need to hear your voice so that I can make the right decision. Hmm. Maybe I should be asking you for the decision instead of having to make it myself. You know, maybe I need to change the language internally instead of saying, Lord, help me to do this, help me, provide for me, it should be seeing it the other way around. And I'm still unpacking that one. I think I've got a way to go to think about that. But so there are, there are three things. And, I, and the more I look at it, the more I think about the radical nature of light and darkness. You know, Jesus said, I am the light, and when I go, it'll be darkness. It's, it's just absolute opposites. And yet we blend in so easily, don't we? I, work, I go to work and I come home and people hardly know I'm there apart from, you know, I do a good job, I hope. But how do they know that Jesus is in me if I'm not living a life of love in action that is radically sacrificial in the way it's lived out in, in the community? We talk about church coming alive. You know, we are the alive church in Mordeweka. One of the things that um, in the 24-7 prayer blog, if you ever listen to it, they ask these prayer leaders around the world, and they say, so the last question they ask is, if there was an awakening in your environment, what would that look like? And their answers have been really interesting. You know, from the traditional art oh, would be miracles and you know, people falling on their, you know, on their face and becoming Christians in the street, through to we'd see the pimps stop selling prostitutes. You know, what would an awakening look like here? To me, an awakening would look like here if we start coming alive in living love in our community. If we start hearing stories about people from a lot, about people that we know who have been doing stuff for their neighbours, for the poor person who lives around the corner, you know, that would be coming alive. That would be the gospel in action. That would be seeing Jesus pour out his spirit on our community. Wouldn't that be exciting? I think, you know, of what Emma's doing with the food and, you know, Kai with love clothes and we're now looking at trying to recreate that here. That's fantastic. And as long as that motivation is love for the person at the other end, not the satisfaction of doing good, yeah, then that's, that's the hope that I have to see us come alive. As I was reading this, I was struck by... The, you know, thinking, thinking through the, the process of how we do this, how we deliver this, it, it reminded me of Philippians 2. You know, we talk about Jesus being a servant, and Paul, when he wrote about Jesus, he wrote this. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I don't really understand glory. It's one of those words in the Bible that really str I struggle with sometimes. But I do understand that Jesus sacrificed everything for us, that he chose the life of a servant. And even having gone to the point of being born and lived on earth, he went further than that and chose to demonstrate that in the story here in John around the way he washed his disciples' feet to help them get the picture that there was no revolution. We're not going to change the world. 
We're not here to look for bigger influence and more impact on the society. We're here to lay our lives down and to love. And that's it. It's real simple. Putting love in action. And I'm looking around at people I know. There's a lot of people here who do that. I can think of times around the meal table where I've heard stories of people who love their neighbours. Yeah? So it's real. It's what we're beginning to do. But it's what we can all do more of. And as we begin to ask God for the strength to love our community, we'll see an outpouring of love that will change the world around us. And you can't stop that. You can't legislate against it. You can't prevent it with by any method at all because it's a simple act of giving. And no one can stop you from giving. No one can stop you from serving somebody. Yeah? All Satan can do is corrupt our hearts so we start losing the motivation which is why we need to keep focused on choosing love. That's the whole point of it. So I'm just going to close there and leave you with that thought, if, if that's okay. I'm just going to pray, and then maybe we can you know, sing a last song. I have no idea. Father God, I love the fact that I don't have to have an idea all the time. <laughs> And it's so good to trust you. It's so good to know that that life can be simple. We don't need to struggle and stress about uh, big issues. Lord, we can simply choose to love our neighbours. And as we do that, as we give them love, we're fulfilling the call. You said at that uh, time when you separated the sheep and the goats, you said, so, so uh, you know, why didn't you feed me when I was hungry? Why didn't you give me a drink of water when I was thirsty? Lord, we can do that. We can feed people. We can give them drinks of water. We can clothe the people who need clothing. We can visit the people in prison and in hospital. Lord, we can live lives of love, and it's easy to do. Father, I pray you'd inspire us to do that, inspire me to do that. Lord, in the office, on my commute to work, on my everyday life, Lord, inspire me to choose acts of love, to demonstrate your love to the people around me. And let your light shine through us, Lord. Let our community see love in action as we come alive increasingly. In Jesus' name, amen.